Welcome to the Human Cell Atlas Developmental and Computational Modeling Seminar. So today we're going to hear from two great speakers, Dana Payer and Alex Van Udenarden. Dana and Alex will each give a 20-minute talk, and then we'll move to a panel session that will also include Amos Tanai and Deanne Taylor. The panel session will last 45 minutes, and this will be the time where we can discuss and answer audience questions. So please submit and vote for questions by going to the slido.com website at this URL or by scanning the QR code above on your phone. So you can submit questions at any time during the talks in the panel session by going to the Q&A tab at this website. And questions with the most votes will be prioritized for the panel session. So to vote on questions, use the thumbs up and thumbs down icons next to each question. And again, when we see popular questions, those are the ones that we'll first ask the panel at the panel session. Please also share your resources relating to computational modeling and development on the Ideas tab on Slido, so anybody can post information they want to share with everyone else attending the seminar. So we want to hear from you. Uh, please go to the Polls tab right now at this website, and we want to find out what you would like to get out of this seminar. So go to the Polls tab right now at slido.com. And as people go to the Polls tab, and answer questions. I don't see anyone doing that right now. Oh, um, it's not updating live, but I see it in Slido that people want to uh, understand uh, what information computational biologists need to analyze data. Uh, they want to learn about new methods, uh, gain uh, inspiration for, for further research, and learn about future development, future developments in the field. So unfortunately, this is not updating live as quickly as it is on the screen that I see, but um, maybe we could wait a couple of seconds. So I see lots of people polling, uh, answering the poll, and um, discussing what insights they'd like to get out of the seminar. Okay, should we move on to the next question? So we also want to know how people heard about this seminar, and that will help us advertise um, better in the future. So we can see as people are answering, most people heard about this by social media or direct email, and also the HCA website. Okay, that's great. Thanks, everybody. So my name is Gary Bader, and I'm going to host today uh, Jenny Rood and John Randall from the Human Cell Atlas office, uh, um, Central Office are going to assist uh, moderating questions at slido.com. And again, our guest speakers are Diana Pear and Alex Van Udenarden, and uh, please ask questions at any time on slido.com. And then at the panel session, which will include uh, Amos and Deanne, we're going to answer the questions and uh, uh, and uh, begin our discussion. Okay, I'd, I'd now like to welcome our first speaker, Dana Payer. So Dana chairs the Computational and Systems Biology Program at Sloan Kettering Institute in New York City. Um, she's brought deep knowledge of math and computer science to help understand many aspects of cell biology, and she's also put a lot of energy into making the Human Cell Atlas Project a success including a focus on the Developmental Atlas Project. And today she's going to tell us about computational challenges underlying a spatiotemporal map of organogenesis. So welcome, Dana. Thanks, uh, Gary, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm sort of warning everyone in advance, this talk is going to be a lot more forward-looking about you know, what I'd hope to have in the future with some vignettes, but more um, you know, early days uh, type thoughts. So before I go for further, I really want to make sure to acknowledge any data that's uh, you know involved in my lab is with my uh, 
partner in crime, Kat, who's been a wonderful uh, collaborator, the wonderful people in, in her lab, Sonia, Beth, and Evan, and of course, the people in my lab, Manu and Esther, are, are going to be highlighted throughout the talk. So first of all, what is an atlas? And, and one of the things that's become a bit frustrating is that atlases become, let's collect a whole bunch of single cell RNA-seq, cluster it, and label the cells. And while this work out of the Marioni lab is, is, is beautiful, this isn't at least what I mean when, when or the HCA means when we want to cluster. Uh, we need to understand what each of the, these clusters are, not just the label of cell type, but what, what are these cells doing? What are their gene programs? What are they up to? But an atlas is actually a, a 3D entity. You know, we are 3D uh, people, um, organogenesis, genesis, uh, everything is, a spa is spatial. And we need to understand this uh, spatial structure at multiple resolutions from histology to the full organs. And an atlas should be built in a way that we can query it and understand new things. For example, how does a disease deviate from normal? So, you know, these beautiful U maps with labeled clusters are, are, are pretty far from what I consider an atlas needs to be. And so, you know, how, how do we get there? Um, first of all, all these things, that was just atlasing vanilla. Once you go into the uh, developmental atlas, it becomes even more complex because it's dynamic. The cell types and cell states are rapidly changing at every time point. Uh, you could see over the course of a day, this is early mouse uh, embryogenesis, the cell uh, types are completely different at, at every single day of uh, embryogenesis. And of course, spatially, the cells are moving around. They're changing their shape. And particularly in organogenesis, and, and, and particularly in the early time points, they are completely changing and moving in a rapid way. Here you can see the endoderm of the mouse. Uh, first, between E5.5 to E7.5, it's on the outside. And then during uh, gastrulation, magically, it sort of loops in onto the inside, showing this uh, complex uh, choreography of uh, pattern formation. So in order to get a developmental atlas right, we really need to understand how the cell types move forward uh, and change uh, and, and change their uh, cell fates. And we need to understand uh, the cell um, structure, where they are in space and how they move in space. And uh, so that's going to be a, a very complex thing to build and we're still pretty far away from it. Now, particularly in development, we have another big, big challenge, and this uh, incredible challenge is, is access to tissues. And generally speaking, when you know you have this sort of high standard of actually working in human and collecting human samples, it's pretty hard in adult, but it becomes even uh, harder in the developing embryo in terms of access to tissue, in terms of access to quality tissue, especially given the dynamic and ever-changing uh, nature of, of, of this. And therefore, I really feel that we're going to have to go to other systems. We can't get it all uh, in vivo human data. Um, mouse is a very powerful system that can fill in the gaps, especially at the really early time points, which I don't think we're going to map uh, in, in the human. And, and organoids is also a powerful thing in order for us to be able to understand this, this complex process. And in order to build the atlas that I just described, you're going to have to sort of interchangeably work uh, between um, in vivo um, model systems in vitro cells that will get more and more sophisticated and the actual human data as we can get it. Then as we map between them, we have to see what changes between these systems and, and, and what is shared so that we can make this mapping well. Um, so again, there's very little that's been done in space. There's a little bit of spatial technologies that have been emerging. Most of them are in, in, in 2D and again, an atlas needs to be 3D. So I'm just going to give you some initial forays. This is uh, being spearheaded by Esther in my lab and even in Kat's lab to really begin to understand and map and, and, and be able to deal with the 3D structure of, of development. So this is you know, some nice eye candy of, of, of lung development. We, we see the, the, the uh, sort of a structural uh, protein as well as the main master regulator of lungs. And this goes to show you just you know, how much things uh, change over the course of each day. Uh, how much variation there is even between two embryos on, on the same day. And again, you see this idea where the cells are on the outside and then go into the inside and then begin to form structures such as lung. And if we want to zoom in just to see, you know, just how structured this is, it's a 3D object with intricate 
complicated structures that change over time. You can see these things continue to bud at 11.5. And you can see that we can now image these at really, really high resolution. Specifically, every little dot here is, is, is not just a really bad uh, resolution. These are actually uh, individual cells, which we can work out with this uh, beautiful imaging out of uh, Cat's lab done by uh, Even. And so in order to get these complex 3D objects, we need to first develop the mathematical language uh, to actually characterize uh, in 3D uh, all the different spatial features that we see. And, and these are you know, fairly complex shapes that change over time. And Esther has been working on, on developing an entire language, an entire set of features that could possibly use to mathematically model the shape at any given time, as well as how it changes. And the goal would be to actually be able to do this. So if we have two time points, for example, the red and the green, we'd want to see, you know, we, we can sample this at discrete time points, actually what happens as um, the cells de develop from one cell to the next. And in an ideal way, we'll know exactly which cell moves where. This is just a little rendering sort of using an Occam's razor principle to sort of minimize the movement. That's probably not what biology does. And we're gonna to have to get more and more measurements, uh, more and more techniques, uh, particularly molecules, uh, in order to be able to uh, understand what the cells are doing. And you know, I, I wanna quote a quote from Donald Knuth, uh, science is what we understand well enough to explain to a computer, art is everything else. And you know, these images are certainly eye candy, but we really need to be able to model it uh, really almost from first principles. So we wanna understand the cellular components the cellular interactions, the molecular mechanisms, as well as the mechano mechanisms and, and the programs and, uh, you know, really how uh, all this comes together in a generative fashion uh, to build these uh, beautiful, intricate uh, 3D shapes and uh, how this happens uh, dynamically, spatiotemporally over time. So, you know, we are uh, quite far from, from this goal, but when I say uh, we want to build a, a developmental atlas, uh, this is what I mean. Now, you know, that's pretty aspirational and we're pretty far from that. So I'm going to sort of take a, a, a quick uh, turn and go back to, to really basic things with single cell RNA seq and, and, and things we know how to do. And, you know, this is a, a, a little bit of an oldie. It's been around, you know, since, you know, two years now. And that's a really an oldie in our field. But I actually want to bring that not only because I really love Palantir, but I think it has a lot of ideas that, that just really... Uh, work and, um, you know, can form a great basis. So the, the basic idea underlying Palantir is that we can model cell fate probabilities, how a cell uh, chooses its fate, where it's going to go, what are the trajectories uh, in, in, in a, a cells change their uh, state and fate as, as a mark of chain. In order to build this mark of chain, we start with an undirected map. Uh, uh, the phenotypic manifold is, is, is typical in the single cell field. But to get a mark of chain, we have to get a, a directed graph where each edge uh, really represents what is the probability of you know, a cell on one end of the edge to go to a cell in a state at the other end of the uh, end of the edge. And you know, through the mark of chain, we can see how cell states uh, change over time. And in order to get that, we need to take our undirected graph, which we have a lot of methods to develop and, 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 and order it. And in Palantir, we simply use pseudo time. The basic assumption that cells go from more immature to more mature is a reasonable assumption in the context of normal and healthy development. Now, I speak about this less, but I actually want to bring this in this computational venue that the details matter. And, and under the hood in, in, in Palantir, there's a lot of really good things uh, written up in the supplement, uh, a really good cell-cell similarity kernel that builds really good phenotypic manifolds that really represent the space well, as well as a method for waypoint sampling that really allows you to sort of get a good uniform sampling that really captures all the states, uh, taking into account different densities and some of the rarer states. And this waypoint sampling was uh, recently used uh, by John Marioni, my colleague in his uh, Milo algorithm. So I'm giving it a shout out because I think it's a, a wonderful uh, algorithm to look at the um, differences in, in cell population composition especially in, in, in a developing system where you really can't uh, build on clusters. And again, that uses uh, the waypoint sampling and, and these sort of tools under the hood are, are, are something quite powerful that I, I welcome you to use. So 
you know, once you sort of define your mark of chain, then you have all this wonderful mathematical mechanisms. Uh, basically, you have this matrix where each uh, entry is what is a change of a chance of transitioning from one state to another. Um, you can use archetype analysis to figure out what are the terminal states, what are the ends, uh, you know, the stable states of the system. Uh, once you build an absorbing mark of chain, the nice thing is you have, you know, quick and, 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 and wonderful closed form solutions in order to compute for each and every uh, intermediate cell, what's its probability of reaching each uh, endpoint. And uh, I really like this visual. I really think, you know, we get an understanding of uh, algorithms if we sort of look at what they're doing under the hood, look at their computation. So this is the mark of chain, what, what each cell can do at one time point. Basically, this is a cell by cell matrix. And, you know, how bright it is, is the probability of going from one cell to the next. And as you power this ma matrix, you basically uh, take more steps. So this is a path of five steps. And you can see what, where cells can go and what are their probabilities after five sets for the different cell states. And, you can see that as you take more and more states, you have um, a lot of uh, a brand probability of reaching each terminal state. And you have some cells that are you know, quite sure of where they're going uh, and cells that are, are more uh, unsure of where they're going in a more progenitor state. So you can actually uh, quantify uh, cell plasticity as, as the entropy of this sort of uh, branch probability vector. And so, you know, this is Palantir, as I said, it's two years old, but it's, it's a very flexible framework. So you can imagine that you can change the, the way you construct the graph, the way you construct the underlying manifold and use different features. Uh, you can change the genes that you're focusing on, but you don't even need to use a single cell RNA-seq. You can switch and use epigenetic marks or even uh, imaging features. And you can change the way the, the edges are oriented for regular development, sure, the sort of similarity, this assumption from immature to immature, this observational thing that, you know, uh, bothers a lot of people in pseudo time, you can use velocity, you can use uh, taxi and regulatory models, you can use the accumulation of genetic uh, manipulations. All you need to do is you build the mark of chain and, and, and then run forward with it. So, you know, here's some examples of some adaptations. This is a collaboration with uh, Fabian Tyus's lab uh, together with uh, Marius, uh, who really had a great visit with us. And basically we combine the best of both worlds of both the, the phenotypic manifold and, and Palantir-like ideas and, and, and RNA velocity. And the idea is instead of orienting the graph based on a pseudo time for more uh, earlier cells to later cells, the velocity says where the cell wants to go. And we prioritize the direction uh, that best aligns uh, with the velocity vector. So we have an angle uh, with the velocity vector for every cell in the manifold. And that you know, weighs in very strongly on the probability of, of going that direction. We have a good probability of going in the direction of, of the velocity vector, of course, uh, probabilistically so. And then we can propagate that through the Markov chain. And this really does give you best of both worlds because you have all the advantages of, of, of the Markov chain to sort of learn the long-term structure of the manifold. It also ensures that your travel is within the manifold. Many uh, velocity vectors just point into to outside of the manifold into regions where there's no cells. And here you're really constrained to, to, to move within the manifold, but you do have that additional information, that information from the velocity uh, to sort of have additional information of, of potential directions. And you know, this is uh, one way to incorporate the uh, directionality into uh, a Markov chain. And additionally, of course, uh, uh, Marius put in a lots of uh, cute savvy tricks uh, to, to, to compute quicker uh, and more accurately chains. And you don't even have to do it with, with single cell genomics and you don't even have to use your, your um, uh, features as, as uh, your nodes as cells. This is work from a, a colleague and friend, uh, Prisca Liberali at FMI, and she basically is using here the 4i technology to uh, visualize organoids. And here now we're going to look at trajectories of the morphology of, of organoids as they form and grow over time. So now each node is, is actually an organoid in an organoid structure or, or shape. And you know you extract features of these organoids. Uh, you do the same graph-based uh, trajectory detection, and, and Prisca has used both wish, Wishbone and Palantir, and and use the same trick to look at how organoids uh, develop. And you know she's been using it quite extensively in this case, uh, finding out that that YAP is really critical for for symmetry breaking. Just to show you how this can you know generalize well beyond you know what what I showed. 
I want to really quickly show, you know, Palantir in the original Palantir in action on mouse uh, development. So, you know, it has a lot of features. Once you have pseudo time, you can see how do things uh, change along? How do different regulatory markers, uh, transcription factors, and and uh, signaling molecules change along time and along each trajectory as the cells go from one fate to another? You can see, well, what happens when the cells commit, for example, to the primitive endoderm, and you can see here that the cells are committing to the primitive en en endoderm when uh, two receptors, FGFR1 and 2, are combinatorially uh, high, and, and, and that's really confirmed um, through, through um, perturbation analysis. At the other end of the spectrum, on, on the final day, you can really see that the, the cells order themselves not only along pseudo time, but along pseudo space. And if you actually look at the cells, they cluster and, and demarcate into sort of uh, primordial organs that are organized in pseudo space, uh, really in the same order that they're about to bud out of this uh, still morphologically smooth gut tube. And you can really predict where you are along this pseudo space based on a small set of markers. Now, this pseudo space is actually the convergence of two completely different fates that one day ago were completely different, the primitive endoderm and the epiblast. And as they converge together in the same um, uh, location in the gut tube, uh, they actually converge to the same fate with an almost 99 point something percent identity. So even though they were dramatically different, they, they converged once they uh, um, moved into the, gas, uh, into the um, gut tube. Uh, and basically their fate is determined by, by their spatial location. You know, here's another uh, quick way where we could use Palantir to actually discover uh, new, a surprising uh, trans differentiation from uh, epiblast um, into the um, visceral endoderm. This is our prediction, which got uh, validated through multiple uh, lineage tracing systems, just to show you that the power of such an approach. And again, I want to raise the, the 3D uh, nature of, 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 of embryogenesis and just to show just how complex the movement is as the uh, epiblast is sort of being sunk in and through you know, a lot of sheer mechanical forces, these cells are being mixed together uh, as, as they converge. And what we saw in this data is that cells intrinsically knew what they were going. We could see a day in advance, very strong signal for what they were going to become, a transcriptional signal for what they were going to become the next day before um, the, 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 you could see any morphological change. But they retain much plasticity. Once they're in a new location, they can sort of sense the signaling around them and, 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 and switch fate. So they still are quite plastic. So to really understand this, we need to understand intrinsic re regulation and extrinsic uh, regulation. So you know we're in a in a realm where epigenetics is, is uh, single cell epigenetics is coming on uh, you know online, particularly single cell ataxic. But it's a bit problematic because data from an individual cell is too sparse, and data uh, from a cluster is just too coarse. So I want to bring the concept of metacells. This is a beautiful concept by Amos Tanai that you know hasn't caught on as much as I think it should. And the idea is you have cell types and clusters. They're not exactly the same things, but even clusters has quite a bit of additional structure in it. And so, you know, a meta cell, you know, some people call it a small clustering, but you can call it a just right clustering where, you know, you, you, a meta cell really is a unimodal uh, distribution where you, you know, you, you don't have two cell states mixed up. It's one cell state to a degree that you can't distinguish it from sampling or, or noise. And, and you really want to sample at that resolution. Now, while the concept is wonderful, the implementation is a little less so. So, you know, on RNA, we have to throw out a lot of outliers and it's not perfect, but on ATAC-seq, it completely breaks and really migrates the cell density. So we had to build our own um, Metacells algorithm, really taking out of the Palantir toolkit, uh, cell cell similarity point, uh, kernel, uh, waypoint sampling, a lot of the, you know, Palantir underbelly to get an initial point. Then you iteratively improve it using some linear algebra trick until you get your metacells that are really tight. And more important than they're really tight, they really sample the entire space, including very rare populations. Uh, quite well, and again, in a direct uh, uh, comparison. And one of the points I want to raise to, 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 to computational biology is something that you know a lot is missed. We often test our things on the average behavior on the big cell types, and many single cell algorithms miserably fail on the rare cell types. 
the, the, the uh, dense cell densities are very ununiform, orders of magnitude different, five orders of magnitude different. And sometimes the most interesting biology in, is in the rare cell types. So here you can see that each metacell has quite distinct um, ataxic peaks, uh, even with very nearby, very similar metacells, one next to another, which would be clustered together in a typical algorithm. But we aggregate enough cells to actually get a pretty good uh, epigenetic profile globally. And once we started working with metacells, then you know it's sort of a just right grouping of cells that allowed us to do everything better, identify the regulatory elements in each metacell, get better peak selection, differential peaks, uh, harmonize data across modalities, expression versus accessibility. And my favorite application, I know it's also Amos's favorite application, now that we have ataxic data, we have mechanistic data, we have so many cells, we can actually build uh, a parametric description, a regulatory model of this phenotypic mono, uh, you know, manifold and, and, and not just a cell by cell matrix. Um, the epigenome is much more plastic than the RNA. And I'm gonna whiz through this because I have 30 seconds left. So, you know, just to get some ideas, uh, in order to, to get the, the pinpointed regulation, you could see in a plastic epigenome, we have targeted RNA. That happens actually through combinatorial regulation of multiple uh, transcription factors. And here we're using both the epigenetics and the RNA to pinpoint this. And we can see this, we're using actually, John Marioni was wonderful to share with us uh, some sec fish data with long chi, so we can actually get physical space and see how these combinations are actually changing uh, over space. And we can actually then add the re receptor ligon interaction from the mesodome to really understand how this, uh, a spatial, how these cell fates are all coming together. So, you know, we have a long way to go, but what we really need to be able to do is for each cell map its current uh, location in time and space, map its future cell fate and position, and understand the underlying regulatory uh, mechanisms, um, both intrinsic and, uh, uh, ex you know, both the cell-cell communications as they grow and move to create organs and then how all this goes into disease. So there's quite a bit of uh, computational challenges and uh, a very uh, long way to go. I'm gonna highlight that our a single cell research center is growing rapidly. We just got a green light to grow. So there are a lot of computational research scientist positions uh, available at all ranks. And um, I wanna again, acknowledge all the wonderful collaborators Esther and, and Manu, uh, well, Manu is no longer in my lab. He's now an independent faculty at Fred Hutch and looking for postdocs, as well as some additional great people in my own lab. This is, you know, everything's a great collaboration with uh, Kat uh, and, and some other people. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Dana. That's amazing. Um, beautiful images, 3D images. Uh, okay, so please. That's uh, all, Kat. Just to... <laughs> Um, and analysis. So please um, rem uh, remember to ask questions for both speakers at slido.com slash HCA 2021. And now I'd like to welcome our second speaker, Alexander Van Udenarden. So Alex directs the Hubrecht Institute for Developmental Biology and Stem Cell Research in the Netherlands. Alex trained in physics, but soon after began applying his perspective to understanding biological systems and is now focused on building quantitative understanding of development in stem cells. Alex is also on the organizing committee of the Human Cell Atlas Project, and today he's going to tell us about cell cycle dependent translational pausing. So welcome, Alex. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited uh, to, to be able to give a talk. This work I'm going to show you is uh, completely unpublished, so please uh, give me as much feedback as possible to improve it. Um, uh, it's our first uh, kind of venue into translation. So uh, Dane already showed beautiful examples of single cell sequencing methods that really allow you to look at DNA sequencing at single cell level, attack seek for accessibility of the DNA at single cell level, and actually Dana showed exactly the same UMAP uh, from the Marioni and Goodkin's lab looking at mRNA. And, and what you can do nowadays is basically buy a machine and do these experiments for 10,000 to you know, million cells if you have the funding for it, which is fabulous because this allows us to really, you know, uh, have a large community of people using this, this single cell uh, sequencing methods. But if you think about these methods, uh, one thing is immediately clear is that these methods cover the first part of the central dogma 
right? So DNA and RNA. So of course, after the RNA, a lot of interesting things are happening. And proteins are, of course, the workhorses. So ultimately, you would like to look at, at proteins and, and perhaps a single or a single cell mass spec or single cell uh, other methods that would allow you to look at polypeptides would come up. But for now, those are not uh, those methods are not there yet. So what we thought is perhaps we can do something related to translation. And of course, translation has been measured already before in bulk uh, experiments. And Jonathan Weissman, uh, more than 10 years ago, was, was, was there to, together with Nick Ingoia to, to really nail down this method. And it's a very uh, beautiful method. What you do is you take the RNA, which is based on still bound to the ribosomes, and then you use an RNA to chew up all the RNA, which is not protected by the ribosome. And then you sequence those little pieces. And this is a very uh, smart idea, and it works really well if you have a lot of cells. If you look at the protocols and you go through the details, you know, they typically advise you to use million cells or even 10 million of cells. Now that's of course not what we want because that will not allow single cell experiments. And the main reason for why you need so many cells is that uh, there is a particular step in this protocol where you run your RNA ribosome co complexes on a, on a sucrose gradient. So it's a fractionation experiment. Now, this is completely inc incompatible with single cells. You can't really run this for single cells. So this, we have to somehow make sure that we, 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 we bypass this fractionation uh, step. Another uh, challenge is that RNAs1, this enzyme that basically chews up the RNA, is it's very convenient enzyme because what it does really well is really chops up the RNA until the edge of the ribosome. But it's also very aggressive. And what, what has been shown before is that it really... Uh, really uh, it's hard to keep the monosome in, in integrity uh, uh, constant. So for example, is an adsorption experiment where you see here the monosomes in this peak in adsorption. So there's no, no treatment with the RNAs, but as soon as you start to treat with a little bit of RNAs, this peak plummets down, you get all kinds of satellite peaks showing that the, the monosome integrity is not preserved very well. Turns out that MNAs, which is also an RNAs, but is not so uh, no, not so popular for, for ribosome profiling. It is very popular for nucleosome profiling, for DNA. But RNA is not so much used. Only, you know, it's actually uh, the bacterial ribosomal profiling are mostly using RNAs. And what you see there is that actually monosomes are much more, uh, they stay much more intact after digestion with MNAs. And this was also realized by uh, Aaron O'Shea's lab earlier on. Uh, but nobody really tried to use this particular uh, RNAs on single cells. You know, our lab is a little bit crazy, so we thought, well, why, why don't we try it? And actually, uh, Mike, I have to say, really did most of the, the heavy lifting of this project. He was brave enough to take on this project and see if we can do ribosomal profiling in single cells. So what Mike did is basically what we always do is we, we take a, a 384 well plate and using a fax machine, we sort single cells and single wells. We lyse the cell and then we use MNAs in this particular application to chew up all the RNA, which is not protected by the ribosome. So then you end up with small pieces of uh, RNA that you then can ligate directly adapters to, and then you can PCR uh, to amplify. Then what we do is pull everything and we run a size selection just to make sure that we look at the, the right sizes, because of course there's gonna be a wide uh, spectrum of different sizes. And we, you know, we see very clear uh, bands around 35 nucleotides. So this is exactly what, what you expect for these pieces to be. So we, we take those pieces out and we sequence them. And this is what you get for the raw data. So I'm plotting here in this heat map, uh, single cells, which are uh, rows here. We have two different cell lines. I'm showing you hex cells and RP1 cells. And as each row is a cell. And then each X coordinate is a position, a position along the open reading frame. Start codon is here at zero on the left and the stop codon is here at the right. Now, what you immediately see is that upstream of the start and downstream of the stop, the signal is very low. Now, that's, of course, what you would like because there is no translation happening. And another thing which is really cool, we got really excited when we saw this for the first time, is you see this periodicity. You see these nice vertical stripes, and they happen every three nucleotides. Now, that's really cool because, as you know, a codon consists of three nucleotides, and the ribosome doesn't move continuously along the, the RNA, but in steps of three nucleotides because every time it has to elongate the polypeptide and that will take some time and biochemistry has to happen. So that's why you see this periodicity. You protect cer certain pieces more effectively than others. And that's what you can see back in this periodicity. So we're very excited to see this. Um, but of course, you know, it doesn't, 
immediately prove that we're looking at translation. I'll show you more experiments later. But first I wanna uh, explain that although the MNAs is great, we also have to pay a price because the reason why RNAs is so popular, as I said, is that it's really very good, you know, uh, RNAs. It will chew up this RNA exactly until the end or, the, or, the, or this basically the end of the beginning of the ribosome. So th this is great because then it, that means that you can basically count, you know, from the from the first base of the reads that you map to, you know, the middle approximately of the ribosome where the P side is. So these, these, these sites in the ribosome, the E, P and A sites, those are the business ends of the ribosome. tRNA uh, and amino acid come in at, at the A site and in the P side, the uh, polypeptide is elongated and then the exit side, the tRNA disappears. So with RNAs one, you always have exactly the same distance from you know, the first nucleotide that you map to the P side. So you just, you know, you can basically calculate exactly, you know, what are the three nucleotides that are in the P side? And then you say, okay, that's this codon and therefore it will make you know, this amino acid. However, with MNAs, that's not the case because if you look at MNAs, our reads, this is basically sequence composition of our reads, the beginning of our reads. You see that there's a lot of a lot of A's and U's at the beginning, and uh, very few C's and G's. And this is because MNAs really likes to cut upstream of an A or a U. It really doesn't like to cut upstream of a C or a G. So this is a, a challenge uh, because you can imagine now that, for example, this piece of RNA which is sticking out, suppose there are all kind of C's here, then it will not cut exactly when the ribosome starts, but it will actually leave an overhang of five nucleotides in this case. And of course, this will be dependent on the exact sequence composition. So this is a disadvantage because now you have basically you know, a random variable here that you have to add up to this particular offset. However, you can uh, train a model to actually learn how, how to basically interpret the sequence context. So this is the data I showed you before. What you, what you can see is that at the stop codon here, this is about 18 basis upstream of the stop codon, this is the five prime end of the read. That, that's why it's 18 uh, basis upstream of the stop codon. We see this pile up here. So all these reads, they, they have the stop codon in the ribosome and the ribosome is waiting for the termination factor to come in. And this is often rate limiting. So this takes some time. And that's why we see a lot of reads there. So we take all those reads and we basically, of course, they will have the stop codon in there and they will have some overhang. And this overhang is sometimes larger and sometimes shorter, but we know how to position those reads in the ribosome because of the stop codon. So what we can do now is we can take all this information, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of reads we have here, and we can train a random forest model to basically recognize the sequence context that will lead to a particular offset, right? So for all these reads, I have the offset that's basically how far it's sticking out. I put all that information into a random forest model. You know, how long is the read? What is the sequence context of, the, of this piece of RNA? What is the upstream sequence? And then you can make a random forest model that turns out to work really well. It has a very high accuracy of 97% approximately. It shows that the five uh, prime sequence complexity of, of, of the read is really important, not so much the three prime. The length of the read is also uh, somewhat important, but you can, what you see here is basically the, what is the truth and what is the prediction. And the fact that you see this diagonal light up means that most of the time, 97% of the cases, this model is correct. Now, so what you can do now is you can apply this model to all the other reads that don't have the stop codon, which of course is the majority of the reads, and you can start to see what's happening. Now, this is a, a little bit of complicated graph where, where I'm showing the read length here in the y-axis. And then the grayscale tells you basically how many reads I find in a particular frame. Right? So I will take a read, I map it to the open reading frame. And of course, then I can determine what is the frame compared to the ATG. And, and I make a histogram, this is basically a histogram. This is the raw data. So sometimes, so depending on the, on the length of the read, sometimes you have read one dominance. Sometimes uh, it's read uh, some, for a certain length, the frame zero is dominant. So this, this is complicated. We didn't really get it, but after running this through a, uh, a random forest, you, st you start to see that all lengths of read now have a dominant frame of zero. And again, these reads never, they don't have the stop codon in it, right? All the information was collected only based on the stop codon, but now I uh, apply it to all the reads that don't have the stop codon. Now you can also apply it to single cells. And as you can see, you know, when you average over all the read lengths, you know, typically the, the frame one was the more dominant frame, but after correction, almost all the reads are now in frame zero. 
So now what we basically did is we, we used this machine learning to correct for the bias of the MNAs and it seems to work really well. And this allows us now to really determine what are the codons in the P side or in the A side of the ribosome. Also, what's really, really nice is that uh, this periodicity that I showed you in the raw data becomes even more pronounced uh, after you uh, run the, the random forest model on it. Okay, so now I want to show you a more biological experiment to show that we're really dealing with translation. So what we do is we take uh, this human uh, cell culture line, like, uh, 293 cells or RPRI1 cells, and we take one amino acid out of the media. In this case, we take either arginine out or leucine. And then we look at the codon occupancy at the P site. So now we can actually identify the P site in the ribosome three hours after starvation or six hours, six hours after starvation compared to rich media. Now, when you take arginine out, what you see is two codons really stand out and they're both encoding for arginine. So there's really, really good. This suggests that the ribosome has trouble translating arginine codon, particularly those two, and for leucine the same thing. The top codon that stands out is the leucine codon. So this is really suggesting now, because this amino acid is not in the media, the ribosome is stalling at those particular codons. Now we can of course also do that at single cell level. So I'm now showing you single cells here for the three different codons. So this first two are arginine codons and the leucine codons. A single row is a single cell and a single column is a position in the ribosome, right? So here are the EPA sites of the ribosome. And what you see is that when you take arginine out of the media, you start to see a large signal here. It's like a two -fold, log two fold times two times overrepresented codon frequency there. So this means that the ribosome is staying there, it's not moving very fast if it runs into one of those codons. Same here. If you look for the leucine uh, codon, that of course nothing happens, but then it shows up here. So you see specifically for the, for the amino acids to take out of the media, it will actually slow down at that particular codon. So this really uh, made us happy because this suggests that really that there is, uh, we, we can predict and we can understand why the, uh, the ribosome is uh, not moving over those, right, over those um, codons so fast because the amino acid is missing from the media. So this is a more biological uh, proof, I think, that, that we are really measuring translation. Now, what you can do, and one thing I want to show you here is that not all, all the cells are the same. And of course, that we get very excited by it because we are interested in heterogeneity between single cells. And some cells actually, they don't stall at all. They basically pretend as if they have enough arginine and that they don't, that ribosomes have no problem translating. So why is that? So then of course we can make a UMAP based on the ribosome protected fragments. So this is in a sense similar to RNA-seq, but now these are only the pieces that are protected by the ribosome. So there's a small UMAP here. It's not so complex because these, these are uh, cell culture cells, but it turns out that the different clusters that we find are related to cell cycle. Also, the, the cells that are stalling at this arginine codons are mostly occupying this part of the UMAP, which is, you know, we call cluster zero here. And then if you look at the genes that are mostly protected by the, by, the, by the ribosomes, it's this huge cluster with histone genes. So this is a very interesting set of genes. Actually, the, most of these histone genes are not polyadenylated, so you normally won't see them with RNA-seq, but we see a huge cluster here. And it turns out, so this is basically the S phase of the cell cycle, lots of histones are, are produced. And if you now look at this one particular histone gene, so this H3C2, now I can look in single cells, so each row is single cell, uh, and I'm looking along the, uh, the open reading frame uh, of this particular gene, you can start to look where is the ribosome having issues. And it turns out, so we ordered this, the, the rows here based on how much they're stalling. So the ones on the top are the ones that are stalling really clearly. And you see here this kind of roadblock uh, where the, the ribosomes uh, are observed more often than normal. And what's very interesting is that this is a location in the open reading frame where you actually see two CGCs next to each other. So you can imagine, you know, if you, if you don't have arginine, you will get stuck on a CGC, but if the next one is also a CGC, you know, you have extra trouble uh, plowing your way through, through the transcript. So this makes a lot of sense. Uh, but it's nice that you can also do this with a resolution where you can look at single genes along, you know, actually individual amino acids along the transcript. Now, of course, this was a little bit of an artificial situation where we uh, took amino acids out of the media. And also now I wanna show you the last part of the talk that we also see stalling in just a normal cell cycle when we don't perturb it. So we use the, the Fuji system uh, in RP1 cells. So this is a very convenient uh, cell line where you can really follow the state of the cell cycle very, very accurately by measuring GFP and, and RFP. So when you go through the cell, cell cycle, you basically move through this fact space in, in circles 
you know, the early G1 here, and then as the red fluorescence goes up, you go into S phase and G2 mitosis here in the corner, and then you go back to the G1. So for each cell, we have this facts information, but also of course the ribosomal protected fragments and we can project that in a UMAP and the UMAP looks like this. So a very interesting shape of the UMAP. We have three different populations that we separately sort. Uh, so the, the, the blue ones are just interface cells. We have mitotic cells that we enrich by shake off. So then when this, this, the cells are in mitosis, they, are, they often, uh, they basically can't attach to the surface. So you can enrich for more, more cells because otherwise you will have very small amount of, of cells in mitosis. And we also have cells that are in G0 here, which are uh, basically confluent cells. Now, based on the information of the facts, we can of course put the arrows also here in the cell cycle. And turns out these cells are walking counterclockwise through this UMAP. So now what I can do uh, is basically order those cells uh, in a one dimensional uh, sequence going from really early G1 to really late mitosis. So all these maps I'm going to show you go from early beginning of the cell cycle to the end of the cell cycle, but now basically ordered all those single cells. So each column here is a single cell. And then I'm showing you the uh, abundance of particular codons, like for example, GAA or GAG, at the different side of the ribosome. Right? Now, what you can already see here, the top one is the most striking one, is GAA, glutamatic acid, is really uh, abundantly present in the, only the A site. So it's waiting for, 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 for this amino acid to come in. Uh, only during mitosis. You can see it also in the UMAPs. You see this huge hot region here of, of, of pausing only mitosis for only this amino acid. Now, this is quite, so that's, that's interesting because it, we didn't do anything to this the cell cycle. It's just a, the wild type cell cycle unperturbed. Again, you can look at particular examples. So there's a my, myosin light chain uh, uh, transcript and you can start to see, you see at the, uh, the glue sites here that there is pausing going on. Uh, only mostly in mitosis. Now it turns out it's not only this gene, uh, it seems to be a really global effect because what we're showing now here are the different clusters along the cell cycle. So all these colors correspond to different stages in the cell cycle where the purple one here is the mitotic cluster. And we're showing the log fold change of finding a GAA codon in the A side of the ribosome. And I, I just showed you this myosin light chain, but it turns out there's a whole battery of genes that seem to be more uh, showing more GAA codons than in other parts of the cell cycle. So there's something really interesting going on during mitosis where yeah, the GAA codon uh, is, is basically uh, more difficult to translate or it takes more time to translate. So I just want to wrap up and uh, hopefully I showed you that we developed an, a new technology that allows you to look at ribosome uh, profiling in single cells, really the, you know, the first steps that we're making here, uh, much more we can do of course, but uh, I just wanted to show you what we have. Um, we really like mRNAs for this, uh, RNAs one would, you would not have enough material left. So mRNAs works really well, but you have to pay a little price because mRNAs has a sequence bias, but it seems that this uh, machine learning program is really pretty good at correcting for it. And after that correction, we can actually identify the codons in the P and A side of the ribosome. And we see that uh, sometimes the ribosome gets has trouble uh, translating things, of course, particularly when you take amino acids out of the media and, and this is how we validate it. But we also see this during the um, endogenous cell cycle and where we see particular GAA pausing during mitosis, uh, which seem to be global. And it's not affecting only one gene, but many, many genes. So there's something going on perhaps with the intercellular level of glutamatic acid or, or tRNAs. Uh, and we don't know yet how it works but it's an interesting observation, I think. Uh, so I want to thank the lab again, you know, really a wonderful people to work with, uh, very enthusiastic, very uh, brave, you know, do a single cell profiling experiment, single cell. Yeah, that's, you don't do that easily. And, and uh, I'm really happy that Mike uh, was so brave to do it. also want to thank uh, the Oncode Institute, ERC and NWO for funding our work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander. That that was great. Um, you know, it's, it's very interesting to see how uh, we miss so much to, to it sort of makes you wonder how much information we're really missing from the existing um, technology that we have today. So um, I'd like to uh, move to the panel session now. Thank you to both speakers. 
And this is the time where we can answer audience questions. So just a, a reminder, um, please uh, and ask questions at slido.com slash HCA2021, and we will um, and vote on those questions, and we'll take questions from that list to ask the panel. So I'd like to welcome two of uh, the speakers to the panel, as well as two additional panelists, Deanne Taylor and Amos Tanai. Uh, uh, Deanne works in the Department of Pediatrics, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and helps coordinate the Pediatric Cell Atlas and Developmental Cell, cell Atlas projects. And Amos works at the Weizmann Institute, and his lab studies gene regulation and stem cells. So welcome, Deanne and Amos. Um, uh, okay, while we're waiting for people to ask questions and vote on questions, I'm going to take the chair's liberty to ask the first question. And I noticed in both Dana and Alex's talk, the um, you know there was a focus on um, you know really interesting data that we can get from different types of experimental methods, uh, 3D information, spatial information, dynamic information, or just a whole another, a whole additional layer of genomic information. It was interesting, uh, Alex, that you mentioned you don't even see histones in RNA-seq because they're not polyadenylated. Um, so what, what dream measurements should we think about um, to support computational modeling? What information do we need? Um, you know, is it lineage tracing, recording? What types of you know amazing technologies need to be invented for us? Do you want me to answer? Do you want me to go, step in go on ahead. this? I see, da um, I see Dana has her hand up, but Deanne, go ahead first. I was going to say um, I'm I'm really in favor of, of the idea of multi-omic sampling on the same sample because development is rather complex and I don't think we're getting the full, the full view. Um, that's why I'd like to all these different views into all these different methods. So I'm wondering if, um, for, for me, the dream, dream experiments would be simultaneously ATAC-seq, RNA-seq, proteomics, uh, riboprofiling <laughs> on the same sample at the same time over multiple samples uh, at multiple time points. So, I mean, you know, I want everything. So that's my answer. <laughs> Dana? So, yeah, actually, I didn't go into that because I was more focusing on the challenges of, of ATAC seq, which I think we're, we're really, you know, still working with to really utilize even that data. The problem is that the technologies are just coming out like a fire hose before we can make use of them. But yeah, that, that's all multi ohm of RNA and ATAC, which I, I think is as an immediate technology, which has the most, you know, open um, mileage to come or and you know that's already available by 10x or can be done by all sorts of uh, in-house uh, cheaper options. I think that's going to give us a flood. But you know you answered your own question. I think that because particularly for for development, this process is so dynamic, and the dynamics you know happens so fast, and it's really hard to to really uh, connect the dots in these. Um, uh, discrete time steps, and, and we, you know, the fact that it's asynchronous, the fact that we we do have some some range of of time within each sample helps us. But yes, versions of lineage recording and lineage tracing, and particularly recording what a cell saw in its history, uh, I think is uh, um, and where it was, uh, I think is is what we really need most right now. Any other comments on that one? Well, if you take, uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Sam. No, I, I, I think quite differently than the previous two answers. And I think it's, it's related to the way we understand development. And we are talking today about development. Uh, and this is something that I think is, is currently really missing. The whole premise of working on development is the idea that the species we are looking at are uh, running a program that is very, very robust in the sense that we are keep getting the same type of organization over and over again. If this is the case, we should be in a position where we are able to characterize those trajectories and landscape the way by which cell lineages, I agree, but they are not lineages in the simple sense of of C elegance, they are much more stochastic and complicated trajectories. But once we are able to characterize them, no matter in what way, we should be in a position to be able to overlay on top of them all the other data, including ATAC, 
metabolomics, RNA profile, uh, ribosomal profiling, or whatever I see, whatever we can think about. We are currently running away from our real difficulties, which are the problem of actually understanding what kind of model will capture those trajectories, because we do not understand them. We are looking for something that looks like a tree in the textbook, and in the data, it simply doesn't look like that. So, so I would say multi-omics is very cool to understand fine regulation at very high resolution. I'm all for it, okay? But that's for the epigeneticists here. If we really want to understand development, we need to have the best maps we can get. It can be for RNA and then to start overlay on top of, it, of its stuff and finally understand how to, what kind of computational model will characterize this in, in, a, in a proper way. Hey, thanks. Uh, uh, you asked the question that I was debating ask, asking uh, first, but we'll come back to it, uh, Alex, and then I'm going to take some questions from the attendees. Yeah, if you're asking for a dream, I, I think the technology is really the easy part, you know, although, you know, it's, it's, it takes a lot of pain and sweat and tears, but the, I think, the, as Amos said, the, the real difficulty is really apply it to a system and understand it. Uh, and I think well, my dream is that, you know, X years from now, single cell sequencing will be a key technology in the hospital, you know, where you basically, so we understand it so well that we can use it for standard analysis, you know, to, and to prevent diseases and to make sure that we much earlier can, can understand if, if, if somebody is, you know, sick, you know, I think that will be my dream. I think the, the technology would, uh, I think I don't worry about it, that, but really to, to understand it in such a detail that you can make like a daily, you know, daily test in the hospital where everybody can run it. I mean, that was my dream. That, that, I hope that, that happens at a certain point. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to take a question from the audience. Someone who put their name as Anderson asks, Dana, we have plenty of algorithms to conduct spatial or temporal, pseudotemporal analysis separately, but there's a lack of joint methods of analysis. Any thoughts on what a good approach to develop truly spatial temporal models accounting for fluxes and migration in tissue would be? So I think, um, you know, there's a distinction with between models and that's like generative models and, and that's where we should be aiming for. So I actually, you know, here, Amos and I love to disagree, but here we, we agree. Uh, the real way forward is to build generative models from, from almost first principles. So if we can understand how the process happens, uh, you know, that, that defines the model because the, the actual, um, you know, first principles and forces are, are, are modeling the spatial temple patterns. And that's where I'd like us to get to. Uh, in terms of how to model anything specifically, it really depends on the type of data you have, uh, either in one modality, in one technology, or integration of multiple technologies. And it also um, really depends on the biological system you're looking at. One of the things I've noticed about computational uh, methods is it's not one size fits all. And until you can really do something from first principles and you have to be data driven, uh, you have to be driven by that data. What data are you getting? What technologies are you looking at? And, 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 and what does your biological system look like? So there's no one simple answer to that. But yes, we definitely need models that combine both the spatial and the temporal uh, axes. And we need good data for that as a first step. Okay, thanks, Dana. I'm going to take a question for Alex to balance, uh, balance this out, and I'll take the highest voted question for Alex. So how does translational pausing and effect on cell cycle affect development? Is it a regulated process or is it a housekeeping process? I think nobody knows. Uh, I think so this uh, realizes first time uh, this is measured in a single cell, right? So before all the ribosomal profiling experiments, you needed to combine a million cells. So in so but I don't know the answer. Um, we, we don't have, so we now use very boring cell lines, right? So the next step, we're gonna go into the embryo, go into the primary cells. Um, so the, the, you know, the idea would be that the pausing probably would, would lead to either uh, you know, a reduced level of protein, but I guess we, we, don't, we can't really prove it right now. But yeah, I think this is really early days. And it's interesting that you see heterogeneity because I think whenever we see heterogeneity, there's always an opportunity for evolution to tune the balance or have a kind of tuned distribution, right? It could shift things one way or another, it make it more pausing or less pausing on a, popu on a population level. And it seems that any type of system like that would have opportunity to be 
regulated either dynamically or, you know, tuned over evolutionary time scales. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for example, the thing you showed in the mitosis, we, we have a few more detailed hypotheses how to explain uh, this pausing. And then one of our favorite hypotheses is related to my metabolism, right? So lots of these amino acids are used in metabolism. And we see a, a couple of genes expressed only during mitosis that suggest that this glutamate is shunted to another pathway. So I think this is very, so this, you know, we're going to test it in detail, but, uh, you know, this also shows again, you know, another layer of, 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 of you know, complexity that is on top of, you know, the, 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 the translation and transcription is the whole metabolism, right? The whole metabolism is sucking away all these molecules that you need for transcription and, and translation. So it's, it's very interesting. Uh, but yeah, again, we don't have a final answer for this yet. Okay, great. I, I wanted to come back to a question that, that Anna kind of hinted at or asked. Um, so developments, you, you mentioned the way we think about developments in the textbook or, you know, the C. elegans lineage versus the mammalian lineages. So that's sort of frequently thought about as a clockwork-like process organized by some cascade of regulators, a tree, um, and, you know, as you said, it doesn't probably doesn't work that way. We, we know that it doesn't work that way, but what are the better ways to think about it? How, how should we be thinking about, the, you know, what, what models, as you, you asked, should we be thinking about to think the model this process? Anyone want to take that? Okay. I can start. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll go to Amos first and then Dana put her hand up. So, so I, I really think that that's, that's one of the most interesting challenges in biology in general and single cell genomics or the techniques we have, that were developed over the last five, 10 years are only making these questions uh, more accessible in a way, but also make it clearer that we don't have currently a good answer. And I think one, one of the key point here is a point of, of scale and resolution. Because if you are looking at, for example, gastrulation from, from, a, from high altitude, it's definitely a process that ends up in commitment of cells to become endoderm, mesoderm, or ectoderm. So that can look like a tree. If all, all you have in your arsenal in order to model it is our graphs, then, then it will be a simple tree. But if you are trying to zoom into this process and understand the finer detail of how actually these decisions or these bifurcations are happening, you suddenly realize that, that this is not a, a graph, like a combinatorial graph, but actually there are very, very uh, you know, wide trunks and branches in which cells are making stochastic movements. And what we have to do, if we're interested in the finer details and the mechanism of those decisions, is to build good models for the actual bifurcations or multifurcations point. And I think the, the, for me, the, answer, the real answer for that will go back to better understanding of the mechanisms of gene regulation. If we can write down computational models that are uh, really capable of expressing the mechanisms or the different layers of mechanisms of gene regulation, including epigenomics, transcription factor interactions with enhancers, uh, and the outcome gene expression profile, I think that's our best way to come up with a model that can also be tested once we perturb some of this system. I think colleagues here can, of course, elaborate a lot on different additional aspects of that, but, but by the end of the day, we cannot, it's not enough to draw manifolds and graphs of proximities between cells because all our assumptions there, which are typically assumptions of, let's say, least action, or parsimony are simply not holding in truth. We, we are consistently seeing it again and again. Cells are not traveling the shortest path and are not doing the minimal energy movement. Okay, Dana, you had your hand up. Yeah. So, I mean, I sort of tried to touch upon that in, in the whirlwind of my talk. And I think that uh, um, the, the, the system in which I, uh, I showed it, the sort of the gastrulation and the, the, uh, the early gut tube uh, development, uh, really gives an idea of what it works like. And, and yes, I agree with Amos that the bifurcations aren't as, as tight and they're a lot 
wider, um, but it's more than that. I don't think it of it as, as a tree. Bifurcations and multifurcations still creates a tree. And um, you know, I think in some way Waddington got it right. A cell sort of sits on a sort of uh, almost energy landscape. Uh, so if you can think of this phenotypic manifold, and if we can uh, do a more and more parametric version of it, uh, take the perhaps epigenetic potential of a cell into account, a cell has a, a potential, a probability to go to each fate. Um, and it's uh, actually a lot more plastic than, than one can think. And I showed two examples of trans differentiation that, that really after very early bifurcation, a cell just completely went across to, it, to a different branch. And so the way I view it, each cell uh, has a, a fate potential, a landscape of where it can go. And some of the paths are, are far more likely than others. And because uh, there's a, there's paths that are very likely that gives us a, a tree-like or a multi uh, uh, fabrication tree-like structure at the high 10,000 foot view. Um, but where a cell goes and what it does and what fate it chooses is really develop, uh, defined by its neighboring cells, by the signaling signals it gets from its neighboring cells and where it is. And because these cells move around uh, with such uh, uh, mechanical forces and, and have so much movement, they, they find themselves in, in different locations uh, and, 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 and sort of program themselves from the signal. So I think a model really has to take into account the cell's potential, what it can possibly take, what, you know, what epigenetic landscape is, is open to receive, and what it's receiving. What are the signals from its neighboring uh, cells that are telling it where it is and, and who its neighbors are and what part of the organ it's supposed to create. And I think we need to combine both of them to understand cell fate. So maybe we need to think more about cell-cell communication models or multicellular models. Yeah, we are um, never gonna solve this without the cell-cell communication. That is yeah. absolutely critical. Okay, Deanne and then Alex. Deanne, you're, please unmute yourself. One thing I was gonna say um, in addition is, uh, you guys brought it up at the end, but um, the cell-cell communication um, is uh, something that we've, in some experiments, we've been seeing that the cells not only communicate with another, but they seem to cycle. These are other experiments I'm doing collaboratively, but they seem to cycle between what we would consider states. So it's not like, it's not also not that they're bifurcating, but there's a dynamic uh, changes in the cells as they're moving towards one fate or another that might be going back and forth between two different microstates or metacells you might think of it. or So, so I think there's all, also dynamics um, in the bifurcation stages when things start going. In. And so they're, they're, they're not quite finding themselves in one state or another. We, it's hard for us to measure them that way. So I'm wondering if we, uh, when we build our models, is there a way that we can try to capture some of the dynamics, which is what I was trying to get at with more of the multi-omics idea that there's might be other indicators of dynamics that we haven't discovered yet, that, that are unusual to a developmental biologist that we didn't think of that before. And that for part, of, part of me would be uh, really excited to see um, an expression of, of this kind of dynamics or this discovery in the models as well, that, that the models would be plastic to this kind of discovery or, or available to this kind of discovery of things that we don't expect. Instead of forcing things into trajectories or uh, forcing things into certain lineages. Right. So, so, so one thing we might need to think about is that cells are, you know, have multiple states at the same time, and they're they're busy. They're doing lots of things. So we need to think about all those activities. Um, Alex. Yeah. So it's also a very interesting system is, is the intestine, uh, more the, in the adult intestine, right? Where we're there. Um, you know, we also work on this, and Hans Klaver showed a lot of beautiful stuff. Where basically every differentiated cell can go back to the stem cell state. You know, you, you don't have to do much for it. Uh, so this trajectory, what is Waddington landscape, where the, the balls are rolling down? I mean, sometimes they, psh, they kick back up, and most likely this is through cell communication because they feel that there's something wrong with the stem, stem cell niche, right? There's something, there's somebody screaming, you know, we lost the stem cells, and then the, the differentiated cells say, okay, don't worry, we'll uh, we'll come back. But somehow that's all possible. So I, I wonder, of course, this is an intestinal intestinal system in the, in the adult, but I wonder if these things happen in development as well. And I think Dana showed a beautiful example there that it seems to be possible. I think we probably underestimate how often it happens. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. I'm gonna go back to questions from the audience, uh, looking at the ones that are voted highly. So Bruce Arano asks, 
um, how should we kind of, you know, when, when people publish data, they're, I'm going to paraphrase this question, when people publish data, they, they have a particular view of, of the data that they publish. So how do we, um, you know, look at that data and update it after it's published? Identify new clusters, new, new, you know, names, use newer methods to get new uh, insights into the data. I, I'm paraphrasing the question. I think it's really important. Um, the first beautiful atlas is now out there, right? Where, 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 if you look through different glasses, you see different things, right? So it would be really wonderful. I mean, there's some, some very beautiful websites now where you can browse things. So if you can make those interactive, I think it would be fantastic. So you can basically say, well, I think this is, you know, measurable plate, you know, and this is that, uh, because I it is such a complex uh, system that I think if the whole world can help annotate, that we so that would be powerful. So I think it would be great. Actually, the human cell is, is probably doing something like this, where where you, you can make this um, interactive uh, send annotation possible. Dana, you have your hand up. Yeah. So, so first of all, I think the the onus is on on, on each person. So I think uh, the, the the people who publish. I think it's very important to publish not only your own interpretation. But the raw data and, and the code that got from the raw data to your interpretation, my lab publishes Python notebooks, but specifically to how to share data and how to let people re-annotate and, and reinterpret, there is actually an, a, a big software effort being done for that. Uh, the cell annotation platform being uh, led by Peter Karchenko, he has a uh, there's a design that was put together by the HCA and a bunch of funded engineers to try and put that together. I don't know how long that will take. I estimate uh, maybe a year, but uh, there is actual uh, an annotation platform being built just for that purpose right now. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to go, there's quite a few questions building up, so I'm going to go to more of those. Um, there's a question for Dana. Can you elaborate on how a meta cell compares with a microcluster, and that might be built on a cell cell graph generally used for clustering? So again, um, it's it's all a matter of definition and how you define it. And I sort of took Amos's definition because um, I really think it's it's the right thing to do. And um, it's basically, you know, in its uh, original definition. And yes, a meta cell is a microcluster, but it's sort of like as I like to call it, a just right cluster. Two cells in a meta cell should be cells where you cannot distinguish based on the data that they are indeed in different cells. I mean, we're sampling the cells. So, you know, we only take uh, some of the, the reads from that cell. So we don't know, they could be exactly the same. Uh, and uh, we are uh, also, there's noise. Now, at the end of the day, I do believe that they are, are true biological cell states that are driven by what meaningful gene programs the cell is doing. What is the cell trying to do? What is it trying to achieve? I think once we you know, uh, go back to the gene space and, and, and uh, go back to sort of gene clustering, something the single cell world is sort of forgotten, we'll be able to annotate each cell and say, okay, these are the gene programs that are being run by these cell. This is what the cell is trying to do. And its state is combined by these gene programs at, at these levels. And, and I think that at the end of the day, uh, a meta cell will be two cells that are in a functionally biologically the same state as a biological definition and statistically indistinguishable from noise in the data as a statistical definition. And that's sort of like the, the smallest unit that you can resolve in the data. It has some uh, added kickback um, advantages that you do get to group cells to get statistical power to do stuff. And yet you can assume that for all intents and purposes or as much as the data allows you to, they are sort of in the same biological state and that gives you power. Whereas in clusters and most clustering algorithms, you see huge heterogeneity within. Okay, thanks. And there's a question for Alex. Uh, how many genes can you detect on average in each single cell in your ribosec data? I'm not sure about the same, the, you know, the exact number, but it's, it's, it's not that different from RNA-seq. So you're in 3,000, 4,000 genes, uh, depending on the cell type you're looking at. But it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty similar. And, and maybe just to follow up on that, for, I'm curious, uh, since you mentioned the histones that you, that you detect, are there many genes that you detect that are not detectable with RNA-seq, single-cell RNA-seq? Yeah, so it's, 
Um, yeah, I guess I, there, there is. There, there, of course, the, the, the polyadenylated uh, RNAs you also see in both data sets. Non the interesting thing is that even the non polyadenylated uh, species are sometimes also detected by RNA seq because there's internal priming going on. Uh, but there's the, there's definitely a population. I, I'm not sure the, the exact number uh, that is uh, detected by ribosec. What is interesting is, of course, also the, the ribosome profiling um, is pro the, 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 it's proportional to the length of the gene. Long genes, you know, you have more pieces to cut. So uh, it's I guess more you can compare more to smart seq in a sense because you do full length uh, uh, analysis uh, rather than just a three prime. Um, but yeah, it is. It, it, I think it's very complementary. Of course, we, we also do it. You can do both. I mean, it's very difficult to do both on the same cell because it's a destructive experiment. You have to digest the RNA. So, but of course, you can take two populations which are samples from the same mother population and, and compare the UMAPs. And, and what, what we see is that there's actually quite a bit more structure in the translational part. You know, we see, for example, the cell cycle uh, is much more visible when you do uh, ribosec compared to RNA seq. So uh, we're still trying to figure out why that exactly is, but it's uh, there are a few, the the U maps are quite different. Okay, and another question from Bruce for Alex: uh, What do you think the ribosomal affected signatures will look like for mRNAs differentially affected by microRNA regulation? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Again, we didn't look at this, but very interesting. Of course, uh, there has been a you know big debates right in the microRNA world about. It's affecting translational uh, efficiency or is it RNA stability, right? So I think you probably can uh, start looking at this. Uh, not, we didn't do that yet, but I think this is a very interesting direction. Yeah. Okay, great. And a question for Dana from Emma Dan. How could the real-time information be incorporated into the Markov chain model development, for instance, when collecting samples from a range of developmental stages? So in the Markov chain, in, in the Markov chain, um, you basically need to, to direct the edges. So, so one way to direct the edges is to ensure that earlier time points are um, before later time points. And we actually uh, do use that. So the nice thing about a Markov chain is it's a very, it's, it's, it's a wide um, feature and you can incorporate um, information uh, in, you know, using a single modality or using uh, multiple modalities to direct the edges. And so time is, is you know, time points is, is, is a very powerful um, piece of information to say, yes, this goes before that um, when I'm directing the edges. Okay, thanks. And um, I'm gonna, these questions are bouncing around to different topics, but I'm gonna continue to go through them. Um, another question for Alex, GAA codons, have been previously shown by Nick Ingolia's group to be the predominant pause codon in mouse stem cells. So would you expect that the enrichment of the pauses during mitosis is so strong that, you would, that it would be visible in bulk sequencing over other stages of the cell cycle? Well, that's a very useful uh, feedback. Yeah, so the, the, I the actually didn't know that, so I'm gonna read the paper. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I think going back, I guess, if you would just uh, look at uh, mitotic cells and you would bulk sequence them, I think you should be able to see it. Yeah, um, because we see a very clear um, yeah, signal only mitosis. So if you would get those cells out, I think you should be able to see it in bulk sequencing as well. Um, it's very interesting that it's also seen in embryonic stem cells, I guess. It could be that it's only visible in mitotic cells for an embryo, and that's why you see it, right? So the, I guess that Nick's experiments were in bulk, so he do, doesn't know if this is in a particular cell cycle or in any 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 stage of the cell cycle. But uh, this is something we can test, of course. Um, but yeah, I think you can do this in bulk. Now we know what to search for, but that's that's of course not fair, right? Because we did you had to do a single cell experiment to design a bulk experiment to confirm your single cell experiment. So that still you need a single cell data to, uh, to design your bulk experiment for it. And I, I guess that, that um, I just, um, when I heard that question, I thought uh, about deconvolution experiments that people have done a lot comparing single cell RNA-seq with bulk mm -hmm. RNA-seq. Do you think it would be possible to start uh, identifying using these single cell ribo-seqs to deconvolute 
talk. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah. So then you, you first have to get real uh, high quality uh, riboseq experiments for the different cell states, right? And then you can do a deconvolution on, on the uh, on the bulk. Yeah, yeah. I think that that is very similar to what people do for RNA seq. Yeah, that, I think that that is really feasible. Uh, yeah, I, I'm really excited about going to really complex tissue, right? Because they, I think there it really will shine even more, right? Because then, then yeah, if we're looking, for example, at, at the heterogeneity between endocrine cells producing different hormones that are very rare cells, that's very difficult to do with 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 uh, bulk bulk assays. Um, also, because these cells are very difficult to sort. Yeah, but the okay, conclusion would work. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Thanks. Um, I'm going to ask one more general question for the panel and then go back to some more questions from the audience. So um, the, the, I, I wonder, you know, we've, we haven't talked a lot about how to make, I mean, Dana mentioned how to make a, uh, a, a complete developmental map. You want to have, um, you know, uh, it's an incredibly complicated system. You want to have um, multiple levels of spatial and temporal scales. Uh, mapped and, 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 and link them together. Um, but we also know that there are challenges just getting access to, to tissue for um, different developmental stages. If we're focused on making a human map, we know that we can't access certain time points, presumably. Uh, I think that the general sense is that, that you know, certain time points are easier to access than others. So then that means we have to use experimental models. There are many that are out there. How do we combine these things um, to, you know, ultimately create the, the, the developmental atlas or the pediatric atlas. Yeah, Dana? So, um, you know, I, I think that um, the way I view it, at the end of the day, if we want a full thing, we're probably going to have to go with mouse in the earlier time points where we can assume that it's a, a little bit more similar and then sort of begin intercalating as, as some of our human data comes in. Uh, and at the end of the day, it, it's all a matter of similarity metric. Uh, you know, when we're building these graphs, when we're saying, okay, here's an edge or this manifold, we, we forget that uh, we have a choice to make and that's a similarity metric. And, and people go through standard pipelines. Uh, typically, let's take the whatever, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 most highly variable genes and, and plug it in there. And as we're going forward, I think we're going to have to develop more biologically meaningful similarity metrics. Uh, we've only recently started looking at the human mouse uh, mapping, uh, which of course you have to do the orthology first, but also what biology matters. But we have been doing a, an extensive degree of comparing in vivo, in vivo and in vitro. And there's just some in vitro stuff that's just because it's in a dish. And then there are some genes and gene programs that are involved in the same processes that we see in vivo. So I think with time, we're going to have to develop um, the right similarity metrics, which will evolve around the right genes and gene programs that you know, connect what's shared between each system, whether it's in vitro to in vivo or across a model organism to human. And, and that's, uh, we have a lot of work to do here. Any other comments? about that? Well, I, I think that I think that part of the solution is likely going to come from a lot of advances on organoids. I think that's it's at least now if we are using the mouse as as our like calibration, it's already quite clear that you can get very, very faithful reconstruction of cellular states in early mouse development using different types of embryonic organoids like embryoid bodies, gastroloids, stuff like that. So it is at the level that you cannot really distinguish the transcriptional state and also DNA methylation state of those cells from cells that are extracted from in vivo. The composition, the tissues, they are far from being perfect, but the actual building blocks are the same. So if we can judge from that, we are not anywhere close to that degree of accuracy with uh, human organoids and, and with human embryoid bodies, but I think we can, we can get there. And if our main goal is to come up with an atlas that is not just describing the states, but try to understand the mechanisms or how genes are actually functioning inside the regulatory machinery, 
then having it all running up in, in organoids would, would, make, would make a huge difference. So I'm actually very optimistic with our ability to, to do it in, in the following years. Uh, and again, in mouse, it's, it's probably something that can be done in the next very few years. So, so I suppose it also raises some computational challenges about how you align these, these things, right? Because while they, the model might represent quite a, a number of aspects or may be quite faithful to the human developmental process, if it's not, um, you know, can we, can we somehow integrate data from multiple, uh, you know, multiple uh, experimental systems and figure out how they, they need to align or how they change, figure out what's, what's general and what's not general. Yeah. So, so if, if, if I can follow up on this, I think if we think about development as something that is inherently or by definition robust, it means that once we are capable of characterizing the basic landscape of development, even in human and even in very core, very, you know, low uh, resolution technologies in the sense of we're only profiling very few molecules. But once we are capable of characterizing them and we have another system that we can use in order to interrogate those exact same states in very high molecular resolution, we have a way to go. We don't need to perform full multi-omics characterization of human embryos, okay? We just have to chart them well enough such that we can project our state, the states that we rec reconstruct in the dish and project them on them. I think this is what we are kind of already doing in mice. So, so that's, I think, is the way to go. We shouldn't get addicted to the, this, uh, this idea of that we are going to fully profile everything in vivo in, in it's, it's not necessarily the most economical way to go forward. Great, and Deanne? I had a, uh, just an observation that since we're, I work in the Pediatrics Institute, we're very interested in early sources or early, uh, early stage um, aberrations that lead to birth defects. And a lot of the model organisms don't, uh, genes that we change don't recapitulate uh, human birth defects, meaning that there is some deviation even early on between programs and model organisms in adult, so I mean, uh, in humans. So it would be really interesting to me um, and, and the community at large is to, to do that mapping um, because it would help actually, in some ways, it may even help us decide how to represent a specific birth defect model um, in, in later stages. For example, I'm not sure if there's and I brought this up before, but um, in other meetings, but I'm not sure if there's a, a good cleft palate, for example, a facial development um, uh, set of genes that, that you can set up as a model for cleft palate and cleft lip in mouse, but there is one in rat. So there's definitely some differences between the model organisms that would really benefit us to know to actually help in, uh, in, in developing um, a better picture of how birth defects develop in childhood cancer. Very interesting. We're, we're going to run out of time soon, but let's take uh, Alex and, and then Dana, and then um, there, there are other questions. There are some other questions in the Slido. If the speakers want to go look there, they can answer them, um, reply in the, the system. Alex? You know, I, I agree with, with Amos. The, the, these in vitro systems are very interesting and they're very powerful. So it's amazing what these in vitro systems can make, like somites, neural tubes. And of course, then you can compare it to the ground truth, which is the mouse embryo, and it looks pretty, pretty, pretty close. I guess the challenge is we don't have the ground truth for the human equivalent, but I think um, what was mentioned is like diseases, you know, you know, there is something wrong, right? If, if you have this particular mutation. So if you then put that in a human gastroid and you look what's going on, then you also expect uh, a certain phenotype. So I think that, that might also be very useful, of course, doing comparisons between mouse and human or other um, or perhaps human primate, primates, but, but also looking at um, disease phenotypes, right? Because they, they, you expect really a difference in the, in, in, the, in the dish. So yeah, there's, I think I'm also very excited by this system. Thanks, Antana. So again, the, the mapping itself, that's what I was relating to in gene programs. If you understand the best similarity metric, then you can do this 
uh, mapping better. But I, I think that, yes, the, the human and, and the mouse or any other model organism divulge more as we, we get into more mature age. But there's a, a really big advantage to these sort of in vitro systems, particularly as they get better. I think what we really need to do is understand the basic principles of how this happens, and particularly the cell-cell interactions. And if we understand the basic principles, which we can understand through multiple ma ma manipulation and perturbation in some of these model systems, then we can actually, even, even from you know core principles, try and understand what's happening at the human level without actually having to measure it. Okay, great, thanks. I think we're, we're out of time, so I'm gonna encourage the panelists to look at any additional questions that were in the Slido and answer them. Um, I'm going to uh, put on some slides here just to end the program today. So thank you to all the attendees. We had quite a lot of people join today, which is amazing to see um, for attending this developmental uh, cell atlas seminar series on computational modeling. Um, all the recordings for the talks and the breakouts will be posted on YouTube and Billy Billy for everyone to look at later. Very uh, much appreciated, uh, Dana and Alex, for giving the talk, and Amos and Deanne for the great discussion and joining the panel. So thank you again. Um, I also wanted to uh, uh, thank uh, the organizing committee of the seminar series, Bruce, uh, Alain, Dana, Muzz, Stan, Aviv, uh, Deanne, and Sarah, and the HCA Executive Office, Scott and Russell from the Bros Video Production Team, um, Jenny and, and uh, John for helping moderate Slido, and, for, and Christine for doing all the work behind the scenes to make these things possible, um, or a lot of work uh, in addition to the people mentioned. Um, just to advertise some upcoming events, part two of this computational modeling seminar is uh, that's focused on the Asia and Australia time zones will happen on February 3rd with Alicia Oshlak, Sham Prabhakar, Owen Rackham, Grace Yao, and Guo Ji Guo um, presenting and, and discussing on a panel. Um, we, all of our development, developmental seminar series are split across the east and west uh, hemispheres of the earth to cover the time zones and make it um, uh, uh, comfortable for everyone to attend. We also have a um, developmental seminar on muscle development that's coming up on February 23rd featuring April Pyle, Olivia, uh, Oliver Polkey, and Ben Cosgrove, and also a similar one for Asia and Australia. For more information on these, here are the URLs, humancellalice.org, under the events, developmental seminars. Um, please, if you're interested in the Human Cell Alice, check out the registry and join uh, if you're working on any related projects. That helps people communicate uh, within our community. Um, we're also ex continue to experiment with, uh, given the pandemic and, and how we have to take a lot of our lives online, we don't know exactly how to do that yet. So we'd be very happy to hear people's feedback on uh, what worked and what didn't work, and that could help us improve, um, at least until everyone gets vaccinated and back to traveling. Um, so we also have uh, some major virtual events coming up. Um, there, uh, there's a, an H, uh, sorry, there's a, an, a, another seminar series for biological networks. The next one's gonna be about adipose and lung networks. And then we have two major uh, meetings, the, the big meeting, HCA general meeting, which will be held virtually June 7th to 9th, uh, 2021, and a, a meeting that's gonna be focused on developmental and pediatric cell atlas projects on August 27th and 20, uh, 25th to 27th. So I hope many of you can make it to these meetings and contribute to uh, discussion and science there. Thank you very much, everyone, once again, and um, that is the end of this session. <laughs>